Hello, I'm Ben Oliver. I'm part of the leadership team at Kerith and uh, welcome to you. So good to have you with us. One of the favorite things that I get to do as part of my responsibilities has to do with the whole area of leadership development. And uh, within our leadership development stable, we have a theology track and we are doing all sorts of exciting things and courses where you can learn to engage with the Bible more. And one of those things is WTC Theology, which is our most formal uh, set of qualifications that you can go for. And I've got a couple of guests to introduce to you, and we're going to hear a little bit more about WTC Theology. And then we're going to apply some of that theological thinking to our current series on pilgrimage and learning what we can in prayer from some Psalms. So anyway, let me first of all introduce you. So Jackie, you will know. Jackie and I are working together. Um, are, as part of that leadership development work. Uh, Jackie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, so I have been a student at WTC and I did the grad dip and I'm really excited now to be the link person between uh, Kerith and WTC to really encourage its growth and flourishing and all the new things we've got planned. Brilliant. Thank you, Jackie. So good to be here with you. You're going to help keep us practical as well in our conversations, make sure we're applying it and bring us examples too. So really looking forward to hearing about that in prayer. Um, and new to Kerith, um, welcome to you, Jack, Jack Johnson. Uh, so good to have you from WTC, a lecturer and theologian as part of WTC. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm, yeah, I'm Jack. I'm a scouser, although you may not be able to tell. <laughs> um, living all over the country sort of ruins your accent a little bit. Um, yeah, I lecture in theology and praxis, so I lecture on um, prayer, sacraments, worship, art, justice, um, lots of fun things, thinking about how we think through our uh, what, what you've learned in theology and how that applies to our lives, which is just a great thing. So very excited to be talking about prayer. Brilliant. Thank you very much. But, and before we get onto that, could you tell us a little bit more about, just in case folks haven't heard of WTC theology, uh, most common question I always hear is what does the WTC stand for which is it's Westminster Theological Center but it doesn't have anything to do with Westminster is that correct that, that's 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 right now uh, we it's a it's a hark back to when WTC first started ah okay um and there was it was a base out of Westminster um and that's just that was the sort of the the beginning of our our journey as a college um but yeah now we're a we're a theology college we uh, we take students all the way from well, as of this year, from level three, which is pre-university, all the way through to master's level study, um, at, which is a validated form. So you get a degree at the end of it for uh, your BA or your, your master's. Um, and so we think about the way that God has moved through the centuries of church history, the way that we read the Bibles today, um, and the way that that can impact our leadership and, and just existence in the church and in culture which is great. <laughs> it, is, it is fantastic. I'm a student still on WTC, um, as is, oh, Jackie has been in the past, and a number of us from Kerith have been benefited it, from it um, massively. What made you choose WTC? Why, why are you affiliated there? Um, it, the short answer is God. Um, I, I was um, living in St Andrews in Scotland, um, studying, and some of my friends were like, you know, what are you, what's next? And I was like, I have no idea. Um, and they were like, well, why don't we pray? And I was like, that sounds great. Mm -hmm. And so we prayed. They had um, a number of pictures and words and came across WTC and they had a job going. So I applied for it and I got it, is the short story. And so just an amazing provision of God actually for, for me for a, for a great year. So that's, that was really cool to see God move like that. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting next to you um, in one of the residentials uh, where they have the study for the week and I asked you a question about communion, I think it was, because you told me that, you know, you were into practice and you asked me some question back, uh, which I couldn't answer, which is something about, well, what's your view? What do you think is going on in communion? And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's, we're already too deep for me. Uh, one of the things that we're learning is no matter what topic you get into, there's always more to learn and others have done incredible thinking and praying through those topics so it's yeah. been so helpful I think to one us. of the things i love about theology and study is that you realize that every question you ask probably has a question underneath that yeah. and a question underneath that and there's just a, a deepness a depth to what you can study and what you can learn and how that relationship with jesus can go um, that you never quite reach the end of which is amazing 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so good. Jackie, what was um, a highlight for you when you were studying with WTC? Yeah, I loved I loved all of it. I I particularly enjoyed the church history. Um the legacy of the early church, the Desert Fathers, and then the monastic movement. Um, And I thought, I just didn't know anything about that legacy. Um, And all of the the learning and the teaching and um, with Christology, all of the doctrines that were laid down. And we we live on the benefit of those, but we don't know the, the depth and the breadth that went into them. Um, so I, I found uh, just a, a, a deep appreciation of the ancient traditions of the Christian church mm. and particularly being in a charismatic sort of non-denominational church, uh, the roots that were there. Um, and I'm now studying at Waverley, doing a course on spiritual formation and again we're going back to that period and I realized actually how much I learned through my WTC course it gave me a foundation for what I'm doing now on the master's course so yeah yeah, just that love of learning and uh, inquiry and appreciation of that people give their whole lives to study one book of the bible and what riches are there for us to enjoy you know it was so good um christology i did struggle with i would have to say because it was uh, too uh, quite theoretical and again so much of what i benefit from i didn't have to think through and still find it hard to think through (laughs) yeah christology um, is the uh the questions around who jesus was is uh who jesus christ was his earthly ministry or uh, what was going on uh, in all of the accounts that we read in the Gospels and, and how do we make a theological account for him that matches the evidence that we have, I think. He says, having also been slightly baffled by... I, I studied engineering, so my, my analogy is um, Christology is like reverse engineering God. So you're, you're basically saying we can see what he did and we can see what people have written about him in the scriptures. Mm. So what must he be like then in order for that to be mm. true? So that's that's my analogy. Mm. But it's pretty hard stuff, isn't it? <laughs> and it is supposed to be hard, I think, Christology. Yes. Like yeah. it's a, Christology is a minefield of the problems that, if you look at the early few centuries of the church, that's where all the problems are, is yes. Christology and Trinity. And, Trinity. you know, that's what, like it, it's hard because that's where we go wrong most of the time. Yeah. Mm. And, um, you know, hard things often reap a benefit you know yes if you persist but that doesn't make it easy <laughs> and even tracing those heresies all the way through into mm. the modern day yes yeah. so there are issues that we can contend with now that were discussed in you know 200 400 whatever mm. and they had all these councils and you know the christian thinkers from across the world met together um and it's still going on isn't it in our synods and there are still contentious things to be mm argued and thought through and uh, you know it is a very robust faith it's a faith you can shake you can ask God questions now I was in a cult for four years many many years ago you could not ask a question Mm. you had to just believe and if you had a question it was the problem was in you whereas we can inquire and understand and use our brains and uh, it, it engage our spirits in and and it's a a wholeness that you get in studying theology which is so good for us Mm, yeah that reminds me of a there's a quote by soren kierkegaard who's a danish theologian and uh you've probably heard the phrase leap of faith it's a miss sort of quote of kierkegaard who actually says you have a leap to faith that you Mm. you there is there is a foundation there is a logic there is a uh, you can you can work through the process of thinking about church and life and jesus but eventually you can get to the point where you still have to leap into the arms of the father yes right the, where the faith bit is, remains important but yeah. it's not a leap with no evidence it's not a leap with no basis yes mm. yes it's very good yeah. very good so wtc theology is a wonderful thing we've been doing uh, courses as a hub uh, based on our bracknell site for a number of years now i think about four years 
Um, and those uh, have always been uh, either a degree level or a graduate diploma um, or a master's. That's what we've been doing so far. Uh, and those come with their challenges, don't they, Jackie? What, what, let's be honest, what is the harder part about that structure? Well, I think through? the real learning happens when you have to apply that learning and write an essay or think about it. So we're all good at listening. We all listen to sermons every week. We listen to podcasts. We're listening to this. But when you are given a, a, a question, you choose from a set of questions, you then have to uh, study and research and read and find sources. I mean, even for me, to find even the right sources could take a couple of days to even search them out and then try and answer that question adequately um, and do that within a framework of a set number of works and a set hours in the day to do that. Yeah. So it was probably the the best element of learning because you you have to give yourself to it. So there, there's the, that's the challenge, that's the rub, putting in the time, being organised, uh, having the right resources, getting help. So for many of us, there's a very big gap between our last bit of formal education. I mean, I've been in education my whole life. I've, a teacher, a teacher's teachers, but I hadn't, I've done some postgraduate work, but it was always to do with my work. Whereas theology, no, I hadn't exactly. gone there. So um, I would say, yes, that, that was for me. I had to overcome some barriers in my own thinking that could I do this? Was I clever enough to do this? Um, and actually, one of the spiritual breakthroughs for me was that God had called me to do it and he would equip me to do it. And uh, uh, Roger Ellis, who's, I think, one of the trustees of WTC, and he's actually a, a master's student, he brought a prophetic word on one of our residentials sessions. And he said, God is going to rewire the neural pathways in your brain and he will give you the joy and delight in learning and you'll be able to do it. And as a current student, I am reminding myself and I've just looked at some work on epigenetics where uh, biologists are actually seeing that the mind changes, accord the mind changes the brain. Mm. So I've now got a biological explanation of how God renews our minds, Romans 12, 2. So I went through that process of really thinking, can I do this? Oh, it's hard. But then doing it and finding real release mm. um, and getting over my worries and my anxieties of, uh, am I good enough? And there's that whole thing of comparison that is not healthy. Um, so, yeah, I went through some struggles, but I'm so glad I did it. It really did spiritually form me definitely and give it's given me I have a love of learning and I think yeah you don't whatever age you are I'm in my early retirement you know you can do it at any age in your life just to go for it really no it's brilliant yeah there there are barriers and when I've talked to people um uh, who might be interested in doing this um there are two residential weeks in the year um don't work well for teachers for example yeah. because they're at the time when schools go back and for term um there's a uh, relatively high cost to it. It's not high for education purposes, but it is high compared to other things that we would do within the church setting. And then you've mentioned just the hard work of doing essays and so on. It, uh, Jack WTC have recognised this, uh, and uh, we're here today, you're here today, to tell us about a new course um, and a new format that people could do if they are really interested in learning more, but they haven't got the ability to go to the kinds of levels that Jackie and I have been talking about. What What's that course called and what's the format? So we, ha we are launching a Foundations in Theology program, uh, which starts in September 23. Um, and it's aimed at the level just below a degree. So lower than your first year. Um, it will take place entirely online. So it will be Wednesday nights from 7 till 8.30. Um, and you'll go through a series of modules from um, the biblical story, creation to Pentecost, church history, um, Christian leadership, um, depending on what options you choose, from our faculty who teach on all of our 
degree programs and teach up to master's level. Um, so you're still getting very high quality teaching from from excellent people yeah. on some really interesting subjects. Yeah. Um, but it means that if you're either a group that is what we might say is time poor, so if you're one of those teachers, uh, if you um, if you don't have the time you think to do essays, if um, if you can't do residentials or, or commit perhaps eight hours a week to a full degree of part-time study, this actually is a much lower um, investment in terms of time. Um, so it's also a, a lower cost. It's a thousand pounds for the year, which still sounds quite high, but is um, under a quarter of what a, a degree um, costs for the year yeah. with us. Um, and so there's some of those, but we're trying to remove some of those barriers. Um, it might also be that, you know, you, you had those questions of, can I do this? You know, you might have left school at 16, say, and, and not done any formal education in an academic sense, or you might have done uh, a very different sort of education uh, and be thinking, is a degree really right for me? And this gives you an opportunity to dip your toe into theology uh, and will hopefully give you the, the basis to go on. Well, if you've done this, you can then go on and do the degree with us. Um, there's an optional essay for each module. So if you actually want that little extra push, if you want to see what you can do, um, will you get it marked? You get it marked. Will you get comments. Uh, you'll get comments. Very good. So you'll get that feedback, and it, it won't be marked as though it's a uh, a first year essay. It will be pitched slightly below that. Yeah. So it's just trying to get everyone up to the up to the right level. If they, if, if you know if they're a bit worried about where they start. Um, so it should be really. I mean, I'm excited by it. It sounds great. I'm looking at the modules and thinking, ah, oh, these these are the same, the mm -hmm. same topics that we've been mm -hmm. studying. Um, yeah, so the overview of the biblical story, early church foundations you've mentioned, uh, Christian beliefs and practice, and then a choice between either the church through history or growing in leadership. And um, I can see the growing in leadership, that's the same lecturer that I've had in my leadership modules, which have just been amazing and wonderful. So um, not to push you to one particular choice or another, but I can highly recommend <laughs> that one. I'm sure the other one sounds amazing as well. Well, we have the, the advocate for church history here already. So Yeah, yeah exactly. We go, so, we we, you know, come and talk to Jackie or I if you want to know <laughs> which one to go for. So that is called, the name of that course is? The Foundations in Theology. Foundations in Theology. And people can find out more about that? Yeah, you can go to our website. So if you go to wtctheology.org.uk forward slash foundations, uh, you'll find us on the. You'll find our web page there, um, or I suppose speak to you guys and have a little chat. Yeah, very about good. About WTC and how we are and what we do. Yeah, and that's something that you you do on on a Zoom basis rather yeah. than coming to our hub. The other courses are hub based, mm -hmm. and and you would geographically come to our our Bracknell site or the nearest hub to wherever you are in order to go to. But this one you could do from yeah. anywhere. Yeah, do it from the comfort of your of your bedroom, I suppose. <laughs> Fantastic. That sounds such a wonderful resource. And uh, something for us definitely in the whole area of leadership development and to be thinking really hard about who we would be recommending this to. But I can't think of anyone this wouldn't be really great for. So if that's you, if you want to consider that, if God is nudging you, um, then think hard and pray into and start saving towards or asking for help financially towards the Foundations in Theology online course from WTC Theology. Go to their website and you can find out more. Well, Jack, whilst we've got you here, we are currently in a series at the moment uh, on pilgrimage, it's called, but it's about um, prayer, learning to pray, being on a journey of prayer. Um, and we are going through the Psalms of Ascent and we'll be doing that throughout the summer. So whilst we're here, we're like, we've got to ask you about this. We've got to ask you about types of prayer, how we can use the Psalms in prayer. Uh, did Jesus use the Psalms in prayer? Uh, anything you want to say about that sort of stuff. But uh, we've already uh, started that series and we started with Psalm 120. And um, perhaps we could use that as an example to talk through a bit as well. So uh, Jackie and Jack, w would you mind reading uh, Psalm 120 between you? Maybe separate that in two. Who's going to go first? Jackie? Yeah, okay. yeah. Brilliant. So a song of a sense. I call on the Lord in my distress and he answers me. Save me, Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. What will he do to you? And what, and what more besides? You deceitful tongue. He will punish you with a warrior's sharp arrows, with burning coals of the broom brush. Woe to me that I dwell in Makesh, that I live amongst the tents of Kedar. 
Too long I've lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace. But when I speak, they are for war. Fantastic. Thank you. Psalm 120, folks, if you want to look that up. Uh, We'll get back to that in just a moment. But Jack, can I just ask you about prayer? You mentioned something only about different types of Mm -hmm. prayer um, and how Psalms can help us through those different types. Say a bit more about that. So there's lots of different ways that we might pray and there's lots of ways that we're probably quite used to praying. Um, So petition, so asking for things is would be a really good example of this. So, um, you know, give us this day our daily bread is a is a petition from the Lord's Prayer. Um, so that's one type. We also have intercession, which is um, asking for things on behalf of other people or behalf of our world. Yeah. Um, so it's a, an outward focus of asking. Uh, we have adoration, so just praising God for uh, for who He is. Actually, not for anything else. Not um, not because of something, just purely because of who God is. Um, and then we have thanksgiving, which is thanking God for who he is, thanking him for what he has done. Um, and we have lament, which is um, praying through our, our our sadness and our grief. And we might talk about some other things. So confession is a is almost like a subtype of prayer. So um, because confession involves things like lament, it involves a petition, um, it involves a thanksgiving prayer. So it's not necessarily doing anything. Um, it's doing a specific thing where you're you're confessing, but beyond that, actually, it's involving a lot of the other types of prayer, okay. whereas the others can almost stand alone yeah. in, in what they are. And so is there a... Uh, so Psalms is a song book, but it's also a really helpful prayer book. And then when you talk about praise and thanksgiving, a lot of our songs that we would sing on a Sunday or when we gather in our small groups are songs of praise and thanksgiving. There seems to be an overlap between... It, you can put prayers to song quite easily. Is that true? Yeah, it's it's one of the things with sort of the Hebrew poetic sort of structure is that you, you just can't tell often which of these are just supposed to be spoken and which of these are supposed to be sung. Um, sometimes the, the text gives you that. So you'll see certain Psalms that will, you know, say to be accompanied on the lyre or mm. on the harp or what have you. And you're like, okay, so this is to music, definitely. Yeah. But that doesn't mean... The others aren't, and the, but they didn't put the chord charts in. But they didn't put the chord charts in, so <laughs> I was quite disappointed. So we get to be creative with that. Yeah, do what you, you like. have to come up with our own ones. Yeah, <laughs> um, and Jesus, you, this was Jesus's songbook too, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is the, you know, the this is the songbook of of the Jewish people that they they grew up singing. Lots of the psalms are present in the Jewish festivals, um, and the, the psalms of ascent actually are pilgrimage psalms. So they are what you sing on your way up to the up to Jerusalem. Um, which is why they're short, because it's to be done from memory. Um, as we and you know, we might know that all the time that songs have a tendency to stick in our heads, mm-hmm. whether that's through the tune or the words. That actually, the, that repetition of singing keeps something close to your heart. Yes, um, which I know all the time with popular tunes. Yeah, um, yeah, but yeah. So it's it would have been. I mean, and we see Jesus pray the psalms. Actually, um, Jesus is teaching on prayer is really interesting because Jesus is. Um, thinking about those types of prayer we see in the Lord's Prayer, uh, in I think Luke 11, um, Jesus gives you this this way of praying that doesn't involve all of the types of praying and it doesn't involve all the ways that Jesus prays. So you see our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's an, an adoration. Um, your kingdom come, your will be done is a form of petition uh, on, earth, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread is another petition. Um, uh, lead us not into temptation is another petition. Um, forgive us our sins is another petition, and also a confession. So perhaps also a lament slightly there, but not not necessarily a particularly strong lament in some senses. Um, and so you see these types, but it's not all of them. They're not encompassing. And when you see Jesus on the cross, you see Jesus sing, or certainly say, but perhaps sing actually Psalm twenty two. Um, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And so Jesus brings something before the crowd watching where he almost leads them in worship mm. from wow. Psalm 22 yeah. while he is nailed to the because cross. It's, because it's the, um, the idea there is he's not just saying that one line, mm. but that he's going through the whole psalm, which mm. doesn't end uh, in the same place that it begins. Is that right? That's right. And Psalm uh, 
so Psalm 22 begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a bit like, um, it's a bit like if I was to sing a song and, and you know the second line, I'd have to think of a song that we might both know, but... Um, I don't know if I want to do it. The only one that just came to my head was like a Spice Girls inappropriate one. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Yeah, or something, you know, something from the Beatles or Queen. Yeah, or yeah. Those things that have... Yesterday. Like, ruby, 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 Ruby. Yeah. And we all go, ah, ah, ah. Yeah. Like, it's those things that have a cultural resonance that we sit uh, sit with, that are just present. And as Jesus sings the first uh, line of the psalm, we we go through that process of the song. Mm. Um and so if we just think about the, the way that Psalm 22 ends, it says, this is verse 31, they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Wow. And so Jesus begins where, where we might go, what is going on with this idea of forsakenness? And all the people listening go, he has done it. Got you. Right? Amazing. Which is just beautiful and incredible when you think of this. This is from a man being killed. Yeah. in the process of a slow death. Yeah. Like, just incredible. Um, and Psalm 22 is a lament psalm, right? And it follows this pattern of how do we pray lament. So it begins from this place of, God, I feel abandoned, I feel. I, feel, I do not know where your presence is. Where are you? And it ends in praise. And what's really interesting about Psalm 120 is that... Um, that doesn't quite do that. It's a it's a strange psalm because actually, while Psalm 120 is also a lament psalm, it doesn't follow that usual structure where yeah. you move from a place of lament into a place of praise. And it, in Psalm 120, like we just read, you start with, uh, I call on the Lord in my distress and he answers me. And it's that idea of thanksgiving. And then it's just lament and the psalm ends. And that's weird because most psalms don't do that. Yeah. Which is what makes it really interesting. Yeah, um, and I think that's actually quite important because the song songs of ascent are supposed to be short, right? They're supposed to be what we remember as we as we ascend the hills, and um, the fact that there is a line of um, "I call on the Lord in my distress and He answers me." The fact that that is where that starts is really quite, I think, is important because they don't need it there. It could just be a lament psalm without that, um, and so you have this thanksgiving and lament as a the psalm is doing both of those things. So this, how could this be helpful um, to us? It's really helpful to hear. So different psalms would help us in different aspects of prayer. I mean, uh, maybe Jackie, sorry, I'll no, come to you. <laughs> yeah, can you think of a time when a psalm has helped you in your prayer life? Yes, I, I went through a period where I was finishing a job and I wanted to finish well. And it was a prolonged period of actually legal, getting legal advice and, and drawing up uh, contracts. And it just felt like I was frustrated and frustrated. And I found Psalm 37. And Psalm 37 is about waiting patiently on the Lord. But it also confronts enemies and do not fret when evil people prosper. Um, and I was literally feeling threatened and thwarted. And, and so I, for over a month, I was in that psalm every day and I used it as my vocabulary. I would take, what I love about psalms is you get like a little set of verses that go together, like a chorus, you know, mm. and that you can focus on a few words and then translate that into the first person. Yeah so that you are embodying that, you are bringing it into your context, into your situation. So I could then I could then bring my actual issue and bring that to God and then just get that sense that, no, God is at work. I can wait on him patiently. I can have that stillness within me, even though this is not yet resolved, that confidence that God is active. And even with this Psalm 120, you know, the very fact that it still stays in tension, our lives are in tension a lot of the time. Yeah. And we walk with God reminding ourselves almost. It's like God reminds us so that we can remind our own hearts that he is with us and how to have the right attitude. And so it, it centers you, 
it calms you, it gives you hope, it gives you a sense of power, really, and agency. Agency, yeah. So prayer just gives you that sense of agency as you pray. And often I find with prayer, there then becomes a resolve. And you don't know why. Some, sometimes it's not answered in the present, but you feel like it has been resolved. Oh, it's You've been battled. heard, maybe. Yes. You, you feel heard. And maybe that's... Part, part of it. I heard someone say once that the Psalms contain every possible range of human emotion. Mm. So you can always find a guide and a help in your prayer life um, through what is, is written in there. Um, well, I love, uh, let me just bring us back to um, Psalm 120 specifically. It says, uh, at the very end, too long have I lived among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And um, we were talking earlier, we imagine many of us can be in those situations. Uh, you mentioned the, the war in Ukraine. It's almost as if anything that anyone on the Ukrainian side can say just lights the blue touch paper, gets twisted. Uh, what gets sent back is uh, just, they're just for war. It doesn't matter what you say. That was their, always the Russian intention, if you like. But this also happens on a smaller scale, perhaps in the workplace or in a family breakdown where you think I just I just can't break through I cannot seem to uh, make peace in this situation you you had an example of that didn't you Jackie yes I, I think you know if you've got a um, you know a relationship with somebody and you really want to resolve it you want to have peace in your friendship but they won't talk about it they'll avoid you they'll put up the barriers you know they they just want to maintain that hostility mm. um, and yeah, and in a, in a workplace when there's, you know, somebody that is disruptive, you know, we hear that word a lot now, don't you? Disruptors. And you think it's just deliberately making life difficult. The Bible reflects that, that there are people that hate peace yeah. and their pleasure is in causing trouble. Um, but that, that sense that we can, I have, you know, I am for peace. Isn't that powerful? That's reflecting that God is for speak. It's for peace. Um, and then, yeah, just being real. I think that's what I love about the Psalms. They are real. Yes. They are real. They're, they're meaty. You know, they're robust. They're strong. And they, they face facts. Um, but you face facts with faith. Yes. No, oh, that's brilliant. Jack, you, you were saying uh, you noticed something. Um, the verse just before that, um, living among the tents of Kedar. So There's a link in there somewhere. I don't know actually if it is a specific link, but it, it, what it made me think of actually is Psalm 84. And um, Psalm 84 is one of my favorite Psalms um, because it, it's part of the, the arc of one of my favorite little sort of inner Bible arcs that you just don't always hear about. So if you've uh, ever read 1 Chronicles 13, um, David is moving the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark of the Covenant falls and uh, this guy called, I think his name's Uzzah, yes. goes to put his hand on the Ark to stop it falling and it, the presence of God is so strong that he dies because of how holy God is. Now that's a whole thing we could talk about but we won't. <laughs> um, and David obviously, I think quite reasonably, gets quite freaked out by this and he puts the Ark down in this random person's house. And the guy is called Obed-Edom and um, basically what happens then is the spirit of the Lord is then present in this guy's house and just constantly blesses him. And everything he does is amazing because the presence of God is just there. And so David then is, I think, understandably then, a bit like, oh, I need to get the ark back because I need, I want God's presence. I want to be where the blessing is, um, where the presence is. And so the ark then moves. And Obed-Edom then is, is then away from the presence and is quite upset. Mm. By that almost understandably this is a bit of paraphrasing of, of scripture um and so he it seems that he follows the ark essentially and uh joins the um what who are the 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 sons of korah the descendants of korah who you'll see as they are the gatekeepers on, on one of the gates to the temple and in jerusalem in jerusalem yeah and uh they write some of the psalms so psalm 84 is from the director of music um of the sons of korah a psalm and one of the lines is, um, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. And there's this idea that Obed-Edom has moved his family from the tents of the wicked, from being the foreigner and the outsider, 
to dwell in the presence to or to be as and if the closest he can get is to be a doorkeeper then that is better mm -hmm. than being further away than that in the presence and that i think is just an amazing thing and the psalms are i actually re used to i grew up really just not liking the psalms not really enjoying them being i don't really get what the point of this is it seems to be music and we never sing them what's going on and actually the more i've studied the more i've come to love the psalms and um, part of it is this, is that the Psalms are real and they, they show a, a, a genuine sort of aspect of human life that is sometimes painful, sometimes joyous, sometimes adoring, sometimes thankful, sometimes not. Um, but it's through those experiences as you pray through those emotions that actually God can meet you. And Obed-Edom's um, story is that as the presence of God leaves, that actually that is worse than everything else. That it is better to uproot and move and follow God. Where are you moving? Wow. Because the presence is what brings the blessing. Mm. There's that sense that once you've enjoyed God's presence, you just, nothing else will satisfy. Mm. That's it. Uh, that's amazing that you got that link mm. um, within here as well. I mean, that God spoke to you through that. That's so helpful. Um, and just such a really good example of how a bit of, a bit of work um, in the Psalms and God will speak to us mm -hmm. and encouraging to hear that they didn't used to mean much to you. I would say that was my experience too. I was more of a Proverbs guy. I was like, <laughs> yeah, just give it to me factually. Let's just have the wisdom straight out. Um, but I'm learning and I have been learning as I've grown older that no, your emotions are really key too. Mm -hmm. And God speaks to us through them as well. And expressing them honestly is such an important part of this pilgrimage journey this journey that's expressed in prayer uh, as God calls us on following him. And I think sometimes we are unkind. I think maybe it's, maybe it's a 21st century Western thing, maybe it's a British thing, un unkind about our emotions, as though that's this like illogical bad thing. And I think I, that is slowly changing in our current culture, but there is, a, I think, almost a, a feeling there sometimes that, or, well, my emotions don't matter as much as what this text says or, or what have you. Um, but that's not often the way the church has thought about this. Um, there's this idea uh, called orthodoxy, orthopathy, and orthopraxy, which is the idea that you have orthodoxy, which is correct belief, so your theology. Um, you have orthopathy, which is correct uh, feeling, what do you feel? And orthopraxy, which is correct practice. And it's not as though you once you've got your correct theology, then, then you can have correct practice and then you can have correct feeling. It's actually, it's more like a triangle and the three of them point to each other. And so um, you might well be in a place where you go, I don't feel like praying. And that actually is a time where your correct practice says, well, that's why you should pray, <laughs> right? Wow. Yeah, that's and helpful. It, and it might be that you're in a place of, well, I know I should pray, um, but I don't really know what to pray. I don't know what the, the I don't know what prayer means. I don't know what my theology of prayer is. And that doesn't matter as much as well because you're feeling something and doing something. Um, and it might be that you're not feeling anything and you want to feel something, but you have the theology and you have the practice. And they will influence each other. And there's a load of church history stuff, actually, where they where that influences the way church makes its theology. Yeah. Um, we worship Jesus from the first century, mm -hmm. right? But we worship Yahweh alone. So how do we have Jesus and also the Father? Right, that's, that's part of the discussion, and it comes from practice, Right. And that's that's important. And they have this feeling about Jesus seems to save me. He seems to be the one who breaks in and breaks my chains. And that then leads to a, a theological discussion. But that's not always the, the way around. Sometimes it's the other way. But the Psalms give you that way of moving through prayer. And at the beginning when we talked about the types of prayer, um, it's it's why it's good to not just have one thing where we don't only just ask God for stuff, where where we get away from this idea that God is just like Santa, who we just ask for things and he gives them and that's great. And it's not that he doesn't give us things, it's that actually there's a depth to be added by praying in other ways. Um, and there's and through that depth, you are you will experience more and more of God. Um, and so take lament, for example. So, a psalm, so think again about Psalm 120. If you stayed in Psalm 120, that might just be quite depressing, Right? And, that, and it should be, because it's you have this one line of, he answers me, and I remember back to his answer, and then I'm just lamenting, and I never move anywhere. 
which is why it's a strange psalm, because most of them don't stay there. Um, and if we were to move to Psalm 121, um, you move to, like, um, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Um, he will not slumber or sleep. And it's this, the Psalms move. And that's true for our prayer lives too. Mm-hmm. And it's not tr- it doesn't mean that you can't go back to lamenting. It doesn't mean that you can't petition or you can't confess. And it might mean that you have to do all of those things over and over again. But it does mean that we should lament and then praise and then thank and adore and petition. Mm-hmm. And then we go back to then we can go back to lament. Or we can or whatever order you like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? But a fuller um expression and experience right. of what prayer is. And we'll see God move in different ways for all of those things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's amazing. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Jack. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. Uh, but Jackie, would you pray for us? Mm. Pray perhaps for a greater uh, experience of those different types of prayer. And, and also I love what you said about um, experiencing the blessing in the presence of God and how that ruined <laughs> Obed-Edom and he didn't want to <laughs> mm-hmm. dwell in the tents anymore. Um, and that that would increasingly be our experience too. That, mm. that would be wonderful. Mm. Yes, Lord, we thank you for the journey, the pilgrimage that we experience as Christians, that we are on an ascent. We are, we are climbing with you, Jesus, to know you better. And we thank you for the, for the words that have been recorded by many authors in the book of Psalms, our prayer book, our song book. We thank you for the vocabulary that gives it gives words to our emotions, to our thoughts, and it brings into our minds. We can bring our own real situations and mirror them in the Psalms. We can see every human condition expressed there, and so much of it is about drawing us back to who you are. And so, Lord, we, we ask you that you would enable us to to pray through these psalms, to use them as a guide, as a a companion, to use them as a gateway to being able to know you better and to see you working in our lives. And we thank you for the learning and scholarship that we can, that helps us to appreciate these psalms, the context that they were written in so that we can deeply appreciate where these words came from, where else they're mirrored in the Bible. And so, Lord, we we set our hearts on pilgrimage, knowing that, Jesus, you went before us. Mm. You pray. You modelled prayer with your followers, that you talked it within the Trinity. We hardly can understand that. But, Lord, that you are a God that communicates and wants us to be those that pray individually, corporately, that our hearts are constantly turning to you. So thank you for this time, and we ask, Lord, that you forever draw us after you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Folks, for more resources on uh, prayer, our corporate rhythms of prayer, or how to pray, um, why don't you go to kereth.church forward slash prayer, look for our prayer Uh, page on there which has got all that stuff on there including if you're in our Bracknell site you can get the link to book into our prayer space our prayer room specifically for that and join in on your site for when you're praying or join in on zoom for when all the sites come together as prayer and keep coming on Sundays and engaging with our pilgrimage series as we go through these Psalms of Ascent thank you so much guys thank you